Hello again. My name is Daria Tuminas. I'm the head of the book market and uh, and Sintami Awards. And I'm really happy to uh, introduce the roundtable discussion that is going to take place now. And uh, first of all, um, I want to say that this discussion is uh, a part of a larger story, a part of a larger project, which is called Market What Market, and it's organized by Unseen Book Market and uh, photo, uh, photo Book Week Aarhus, which is a um, week photo book uh, event happening in Denmark, exactly within the same time framework as the Unseen Book Market and Unseen Amsterdam. So we decided to join forces and uh, create a dialogue together and between platforms. So we started it at Unseen website where we posted uh, statements about book market today by three uh, uh, experts, uh, Gary Badger, Sebastian Howe, and Olivier Kablad. And uh, then the questions that they raised in their text were raised also in the roundtable discussion that was happening a day ago in Aarhus at a similar panel and uh, they also kind of uh, wrote a statement or their conclusions uh, of the discussion and passed again uh, to us. So we will be able to hear a bit of more of the context of the larger discussion as well. And uh, after uh, this presentation, we will form a booklet that it would be possible to download uh, at an um, unseen website a bit later after the fair. So we will put there all the texts, all the quotes from discussions, and plus two unique materials by Carlos Patorno and Natalia Baluta. So please uh, uh, check the website of Unseen uh, maybe in a couple of weeks after the fair, and you'll find uh, a PDF of the booklet that you can download and read it all. So uh, now I would like to introduce Raymond Franken, who is going to be moderator for the for the panel tonight. He's right here. He's a critic and writer based in Amsterdam, also working as an editor, researcher, actually uh, uh, having multiple functions, working with funds, artists, different institutions. Uh, and Raymond will uh, introduce uh, all our speakers. So Raymond, I give the word to you and enjoy. Thank you. Am I understandable also in the back? Yeah? Great. I'll do it like this. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Unseen and uh, Aarhus Photo Week for organizing this session um, and for inviting these three guests. Uh, and um, more specifically, I would like to thank Daria and uh, Anna Ruigt for uh, the work behind the screens. And Daria, she's also manager of the photo book market. And that's obvious, obviously what we are going to talk about, the photo book market. Um, you can see three people, experts in their own right. Next to me is sitting Natalia Baluta, and she's representing a collective of Russian uh, artists um, that mainly self-publish their books. And uh, well, she's here at Unseen. And also uh, a part of her collective is at the moment in New York uh, representing uh, as well. And she will talk about her work as a photographer, as a self-published author, but what makes her an expert in another sense is uh, that she has many, many, many years experience in uh, the Procter & Gamble and Coca-Cola companies in um, consumer and market knowledge, in uh, strategic, uh, strategic development. And uh, later on, I will ask her to share some insights she has gained uh, in that work um, and the ways this experience may be applied to the market for photo books as well. Next to her, in the middle, Richard Sporleder, founder, owner of uh, Café Lemitz. Café Lemitz is a bookstore in uh, Cologne, specialized in photo books. And he will tell us more about the way uh, the ways he organizes uh, the, the selling 
uh, of, uh, of, of, of contemporary photo books, but also the ways uh, and his experiences with uh, book fairs and, um, well, reaching out to the market, to the audience that's interested in photo books. And uh, at the far left hand of the table, we have our Eminence Grise, it's Bas Vroege. Uh, and um, he is founder and director of Paradox and Wydoc, two uh, Dutch organizations specialized in documentary photography and uh, especially skilled in presenting uh, photographic projects in really, really diverse ways. And uh, he will talk about his business, his ex 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 experience, but uh, also about uh, the way uh, Paradox and Wydoc uses marketing strategies and uh, distribution tools to gain access to the community. Um, in order to get to know these three people a bit more and to juice it up, We've asked them to present, each of them, to present a case, or rather two cases. Um, so, one case to present best case scenario, a best seller, and also afterwards a worst seller, or a disastrous project, or whatever they choose. And also to reflect upon that. Why was this book or this project such a, such a huge success um, uh, in terms of sales? And why was another project that is maybe comparable in a way or another not a, such a success? And uh, to start off, I would like to say ladies first. <laughs> Natalia, would you like to stand there? And there will be also some slides of the, the books that you will uh, present. Hello, this is a great opportunity to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to tell about two books. One of them is actually my own book because I'm an artist and self-publishing them. And uh, my book I know the best, all the story behind it. Um, so how do we go to the slides with the images? Okay, I will start a little bit uh, of the background uh, about my book before it appears. The book is actually about the future. It was my big experiment. I was trying to figure out if it's possible to photograph the future. Uh, and uh, actually, I think that was uh, one of the uh, key reasons uh, for this to be interesting for many people, because it's uh, experimental. Not many uh, similar projects exist. Not many people, for some reason, are connecting photography with the future. Uh, while it's, for me, it was very interesting to experiment with the medium and uh, to apply some of uh, the knowledge I have from the business perspective, where we uh, for strategic purposes, uh, for different businesses, are often trying to predict the future, and it's not anything from science fiction. There are uh, technologies how to do that, and I was trying just to bring those technologies to life with uh, photographic methods. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And the book also invites uh, the uh, viewer, the reader, uh, to co-participate in creation of the future. Uh, it has envelope embedded uh, with a postcard where um, each person can put his or her vision of the future, seal it, and kind of send to herself or himself into the future. It's really a tool. This book is a tool to facilitate the thinking about the future. It's not giving any answers and just suggesting the ways to think about the future. Uh, and. Um, well, we are not working with the big editions in our team because we are 
artist, we don't exaggerate uh, the meaning of the book for our project. So it was edition of 100 copies, more or less, and it sold out. It's not the only book which is selling out um, in our team, but important for me that a um, great part of the sales went not to the individual people, but to the institutions, uh, to museums, libraries, uh, art schools which to me means that um, not only individual people will have it on their shelves, but um, more people would have access to this book uh, in the specialized places. And uh, with this, my ideas can travel more than just 100 copies. 100 copies which um, um, goes to the individual people means more or less 100 people owning it, uh, but one copy on the shelves of, let's say, Metropolitan uh, Museum Library means uh, probably um, hundreds of people uh, who will be exposed to that. So that's uh, the key reason I have chosen this book as a successful one. And of course, it's just paid out uh, for its production and gave me some, some money for living. Uh, and um, it inspires a lot of people with the uh, content. And the other book uh, which I would like to show, it's uh, one of the least successful. It was really small edition, uh, but um, we still have some copies available. It's not really going fast. And uh, the book is uh, very nicely done. It's a beautiful photography. It's a smart uh, design. Um, it's actually visually appealing. But when we're putting it uh, on the table uh, for sale, very few people were even touching and taking this book uh, to go through. And if they were taking it, they were very fast to put it back. Uh, and uh, we were thinking about this um, issue uh, for a long time with, uh, within the team, and we came to the conclusion that the story of the book is probably too close, to local, and it's not inviting too many uh, people uh, to relate to the story. It's actually about uh, women from uh, former Soviet Union who immigrated to Germany and live in Germany, and it focuses on the memories and things they keep from their um, past life with them now. So it's only for this small community of women, it's probably interesting, or for some community of the immigrants, but not beyond. And uh, therefore, it was really very limited interest to the book, even though we all like it. I have it in my own library, but unfortunately, it's not very successful. And how large was the edition of this specific book? 50 copies. 50 five copies. 5 all. Yeah, thanks. And what was its title? Because... Uh, the title of this book was uh, Secret. Secret. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. For sharing this. Afterwards, there will be room and possibility for uh, some questions and remarks from the audience. I will get to that later. Um, well, oh, do we need to yeah, we need to. Richard, can can you? Can buses buses first? Yeah, <laughs> we will follow the, the the order of the slides. So good afternoon. Um, Paradox, I have to explain you a little bit of Paradox. Paradox is a company, um, is a not-for-profit organization, which is uh, issue-driven, and we deal with documentary photography. Often if we try to characterize what we do, we identify um, as being involved in um, what we could call slow journalism, which is in journalism the equivalent of slow food. You know, it takes more time to come up with something with more value and more taste and more depth in many ways. And it's a practice that is um, contested in, uh, in the, has been contested in the past 20 years. And we are trying to overcome, let's say, the lack of support, um, economic support from, let's say, print media traditionally to um, by, let's say, compensating it by, by making documentary productions live in alternative spaces. And um, that includes, of course, exhibition, exhibitions that included 
interactive storytelling that began with CD-ROM for us in the uh, early 1990s. And of course, it's including the web when it came into being in the mid 90s up to the multimedia storytelling starting in um, around 2000 when it became really multimedia capable. And, um, and of course, it still includes the, um, the wonderful medium and platform of the photo book. And, uh, but as we work, as we often say, multi-platform, it means that um, books may have components um, that relate to another platform. So books may include URLs, books may include QR codes that can call up a video, depending on the situation. Um, uh, exhibitions may include books, exhibitions may make use in order to provide people with layered information about the background of, of, of subject matter, uh, make use then of, of web-based uh, storytelling. So that's it's, for us, it's very much an integrated um, uh, component. For every project that we do, we decide on which platform actually the project is going to live. Uh, and the books are still one of them, but we do not um, we produce about, we do three to four new projects every year, and the average is that there are about, well, let's say all between one and two book titles every year. Therefore, we do not consider ourselves to be proper book publishers. The number is too low. So we will always try, whenever possible, to work with co-publishers. And the difficulty with that is because we um, uh, have very strong opinions about how these platforms around the subject matter should relate to one another that we tend to package our book, uh, our books. And packaging is, let's say, uh, jargon uh, in the business for developing a book entirely, including the full editing and the design and, and the, the, choose, the, the choice of the design company, and then talk to the co-publishers and say, hey, would you be interested in co-publishing this book that's actually a finished product but relates also to exhibitions? And so, yeah, the co-publishers like the fact that there is an exhibition that is marketing-wise an interesting thing to do, but they have trouble, of course, of being confronted with a finished product that they have hardly or no influence in, let's say, how it will show it and share it with the audience. So these collaborations are, I must say, unfortunately, often short-lived. And um, either they go bust or, yeah, the, the tensions have been too high to continue. Uh, but we continue to find new collaborations and we still think it's possible to do those kind of things. Now, two productions I'd like to share with you. Um, one is a book that we published in 2003, um, and I'm not sure whether I should consider it uh, our best seller or our worst seller. Um, sometimes it's very hard to tell. For us, the most important thing, we're often asked, as we are dealing with the socially driven issues, what is the impact of your production? Huh? Uh, did it contribute in any well, to, to, to additional, let's say, understanding of that social issue? Or did it invoke or contribute to social change? Now, these are the hardest questions you can get from your funders in evaluating the project. And we've learned, um, sometimes we have productions, we're also doing films, by the way. Um, um, sometimes we have productions that reach let's say 500,000 people, and still it's hard to say whether reaching out to 500,000 with a movie that is successful has as much impact as a book with the press run of 500. Um, beautiful example is, for example, with uh, von Dender in this book, was published in 2003. We're now looking at the index, which is at the far end of the book. By the way, it doesn't matter. It is a book that was um, dealing with migration in Europe. And at the time, 2003, Art von Denner had already been working for 10 years, or more than 10 years, on this subject. I mean, so going back, I mean, so migration in Europe has been high on the agenda for us at least, for let's say, let's say more than 20 years. Huh? This book has become kind of legendary. It's focusing at the Europe of, yeah, we can move maybe to the next uh, example. And then to the next, yes, it's, we, 
all right? And what you see actually is, and the impression is a bit false here, but the book is, let's say, for 80%, it is, let's say, traditional humanist photo reportage of the best sort. It's a traditional, let's say, it's all black and white, uh, black and white, um, 35 millimeter work. And it is looking at, let's say, um, uh, migration as a, as a phenomenon. We're not focusing on individual people, but you see it as a phenomenon across Europe happening. It is then intersected with these color pages, every 20 pages or so, where actually you are confronted, you get these texts, these texts actually come from letters that migrants wrote home, or the letters they received from their relatives, where they are speaking about the conditions and what they found or did not find. And that is confronted with images that are actually taken from, um, from um, uh, travel brochures. And why are they there? The one to make, let's say, identification with an individual person possible, the second to introduce the notion of paradise. All these migrants come here and came here because Europe represented, let's say, the social paradise they were expecting. And of course, the, the, the real situation was often shit. At the same time, we take a plane and travel to the places they just came from, inspired by this type of imagery. So we found it important to cross-cut this book, you know, juxtapose the flow of those things. With it. This book was um, failed in Holland. Um, well, failed, we thought at the time. I think six to 700 copies got sold during the first year, making the Dutch co-publisher Metzen Schild at the time immediately put it to the Ramsch within a year's time. You know, so it felt like a total defeat. At the same time, the total press run for the book was 6,500. There was a French co-edition with Actes Sud. There was a German one with Braus. There was a Spanish one with Lundberg and, and so forth. So altogether, still, there are six and a half. Yeah, was it a success or a failure? Hard to tell. It got into Badger and Par, which is another eh, an acknowledgement that you, uh, that you did something right for, let's say, us as a photographic community, and it was also subject of another study in, in Sweden. Now, we jump to the next book. Is, this book is Offside, and it's actually focused on, a well, let's say, forgotten conflict uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, which is a runaway region of Azerbaijan, which, uh, uh, from the 1990s, which is a conflict between Armenia and, and, uh, and, and um, uh, uh, Azerbaijan, sorry, uh, Armenia uh, Armen and Azerbaijan. And um, it is focusing, on, in order to introduce, reintroduce this complicated story, we were focusing, or well, the, the photographer, Dirk Jan Visser, and the historian, Arthur Huizinga, were focusing actually on um, um, a football team from uh, Agdam, which is a city just across the, well, the, now the border um, in, in uh, Azerbaijan. And Agdam was totally destroyed during the war. There's not a single soul living there anymore. And, but Agdam now plays from, um, uh, from, from, uh, from Baku. So it's, it's actually in exile. It's a football club playing in exile based in Baku. Uh, and then, because they're in Baku, they're picking up and benefiting from, let's say, the, the, the economic conditions uh, of the few families that run the country, basically. And it, it receives a lot of money. So this poor club that once was at the lowest of the league when, uh, when Azerbaijan was still Azerbaijan is now playing internationally, even European uh, at times. Whereas Stepanakert, the, the capital of, of the province, then of Nagorno-Karabakh, is in total isolation because the one array region is not recognized by any international country but uh, Armenia. Now, this book takes the model in order to introduce this complicated story. You are focusing with t using football as an identifier and we're using eight different characters who have a relationship either with, with either football club and who, whose uh, situations often 
um, uh, intersect. And it's a book that is more produced like film-like photographs that continue over the edges of the, of the pages. This is a book that was printed. It's one of our worst sellers, worst sellers. And yet you may argue, and this is my point, um, if you're dealing with impact and the implications, um, it had quite a lot of impact in terms of, let's say, um, this was a book all of a sudden we were called by, let's say, the Azerbaijani uh, mission in, in, the, in the European Union that was trying to convince us to, to get the book and, and do a presentation to parliamentarians. And because they thought they could use it to prove their point of view, um, and, um, and which we refused to do. We said we would like to be invited to the European Parliament, but we would like to be invited by, um, let's say, the, the, the chairman of the committee or the chairman of the parliament, as had been the case for Go No Go, because Go No Go also exists as a film which premiered at the European Parliament for a debate on migration. So here, I said, we did not want to be used, let's say, in a political sense, yet it made that impact. And just recently, we learned that the new president of Nagorno-Karabakh wants the show to be taken over. This is 10 years after. I mean, we dismantled the show because it was not going to happen. Of course, we brought it back to the region. We tried people to relate and bring them into the dialogue. It was too difficult. It was too difficult. And now, uh, when we've dismantled the show, I mean, you get this phone call say, hey, actually, we are ready. We would like to have your project and show it. So, yeah, maybe only 500 copies were sold, but the fact that it's politically uh, picked up and made part of, of potentially change or opening up or an exchange or a debate is, for us, very important. And one other thing with, uh, with photo books and increasingly with this type of production, um, the impact is often way beyond, not just by these circumstances, but way beyond the exact number of the print run. Um, increasingly, we felt we're also the, the say the publishers of Poppy. I'm not sure whether you know this book on uh, trails of Afghan her uh, of Afghan heroin. Twenty years of, of storytelling on on the uh, Afghanistan situation. Um, three and a half thousand copies. Also very good for a photo book in general. Um, but um, most importantly, would you see that many subjects that are um, no longer carried by the press and that we are no longer, we are us, 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 let's say news consumers as well, um, think that we've heard enough or too much Afghanistan, pff, so long, nothing is going to happen. We don't want to hear about it anymore. There's so many of these subjects. I mean, if it's, if it's hurricanes, if it's, it doesn't matter. Media fatigue is something the media suffer from, but we all suffer from it. And um, what we've learned by doing these productions, that sometimes by creating, let's say, um, an original approach or a fresh approach or a different approach of reintroducing a story by making a special book or a controversial exhibition or um, a strange film, um, that attention is back. And uh, people will then invite you also to, to, let's say, to news shows that are prime time on television. And as a publisher, you see there's, that, yeah, oh, there's a book on the table. You see it in the screen of the, of, of uh, say, oh, please show the book. No, 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 the book is there. But the debate is not about the book, but is immediately with the authors about the subject. Yeah. And um, that is, um, I think, immeasurable. So the cultural product of the book, however small in its circulation, may still have an enormous importance in reintroducing the subject matter to a large audience. So impact is something different than a bestseller. These two things do not necessarily overlap and match and be are the same thing. So, yeah. that, that's Sorry. a wonderful insight. Thanks yeah. for sharing this uh, experience with us. Yeah. Richard, take the stage. So once again, hello to everybody. 
thank you very, very thank you very much for the invitation for the unseen uh, market here. Uh, my name is Richard Sporleder. I'm based in Cologne. Uh, I'm the founder. I'm the founder of the Cafe Limits Footbooks. Um, the business uh, I started with the business in 2012, um, but uh, after five years working in a footbook store, I decided not to run a physical store but to take uh, to use my time to visit fairs, to get in contact to the uh, clients who are interested in photo books and to the photographers as well, and to the publishers who are making the photo books. Um, why I named my uh, business Cafe Limits Photo Books? The reason is that uh, has been my own, my, my first photo book uh, I bought, not knowing that it's a photo book, but only because of the cover used for Tom Waits album. Many of, of you uh, know, do know this. And uh, after years, I met um, Cafe Le um, Anders Petersen by himself and remembered me that I, I bought a photo book and it's waiting on the shelf to be rediscovered. And so I asked him whether it's something against or would he would agree that I name my uh, business Cafe Limits photo books. Um, what a surprise. This is also uh, the photo book I chose uh, as uh, my bestseller. It's uh, Cafe Limits photo books. If you take the cover, the Dutch jacket back, you see it's a real complete understatement. So it's just the content. And that makes me very, uh, has impressed me because this is a book in black and white um, that's um, living from, from the content and not uh, from any special effects. It's traditional, uh, bounded in hardcover. And since it's released in 1978, uh, it's uh, still the same size. First uh, published as a soft cover and later as a hard cover, did the publishing house Schirma Mosel never give the rights to another co company to, to make the book? Only in 2012 there was a Japanese publisher who made it. Um, the story of the book is that Anders Petersen, Swedish photographer, uh, born in 1944, visited uh, 1967 uh, Hamburg, where this cafe, a beer joint, is, is, uh, is based. And uh, during he going to the toilet, the uh, people in the cafe, the beer joint, uh, used his camera to shot, shot some pictures. And he came back and uh, he just asked them whether he can also use the camera to take some photographs. So you see this is a journey back to the for, to earlier times, in the, in the early late uh, 60s, and uh, 10 years after this, he uh, firstly shown the pictures, and uh, that was the beginning of the production of the book that was published in 1978. Uh, until that time, the book has been published very, very uh, often, made a new print run, after uh, the text has been in, only in German, the first edition, that follows the English translation also in the book and, and to, uh, in the last year also French text for the book. So make that, uh, that the story can be understood by everybody. In my opinion, the story is not, uh, there's not so many things to, um, to declare about the, 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 the book. It's only it's a journey, it's a, a social landscape. You can see uh, the, the people there and it's up to you to decide whether you like it or not. Uh, when the new release came out in, 2000, in 2017 in the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, Frankfurt, uh, they, there were many comments on the, on the wind internet blog and they said what, what awful book and people you can see it every, every time if you go to a beer joint, this drunken people and the people are really, whether they like it or they hate it. And uh, my experience has made that this has been uh, very successful because all the people see it also as an, as an influence for their own work, as a traditional book. The book has never been a bargain book. Uh, his value of nine, uh, around 30 euros is from the first day until, until today. Okay, the change in 30 D mark changes in 30 euros, but don't talk about that. So um, this is the reason why I'm really uh, selling this book very well. Uh, offer I never make uh, advertising for the book, 
just my name, and people ask me why are you selling this book and why are you also named uh, your business Café Limits Photo Books. And that is so all that's, I do that's also a brilliant marketing strategy for your own business. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, not only have the three of you shared insight into your own practice, what you do on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, but also you shared, uh, you've shared with us five stories uh, that make up these books. And of course, selling books, making photo books, is not just about the physical object. It's not just about selling paper to uh, people who are interested. It's also about reaching out, telling stories, and um, sharing experiences. And you've done that in a wonderful way. Thank you. Um, as uh, Daria mentioned, uh, two days before in August, there was a similar discussion regarding photo books and the photo book market. And they've sent us a summary of some uh, things, remarks that were uh, mentioned during this discussion. I would like to share some of these with you, not all of them. They will be published, of course, in a few weeks on the, the website of, uh, of Unseen. Um, but one of the conclusions is it's not only difficult to get the book out there, as an artist and publisher, sometimes it's just as difficult to bring the book in there, into a small bookshop or an alternative space, especially when you're situated in the periphery as an artist, as a small-scale publisher. And also one of the remarks that there is no secret recipe, neither for the artist or publisher, nor for the bookseller. Each book demands its own strategy, and many times there are mixed approaches for distribution. For instance, using traditional distribution, direct sales, and alternative models, such as crowdfunding. That being said, I would like to um, switch to one of the main topics of uh, today's uh, roundtable discussion, and that is distribution. Um, because obviously that's a really important factor in getting the book across towards the market. And um, I would like to ask uh, Natalia to share some of her experiences regarding um, selling and marketing uh, consumer goods and luxury products to a large-scale audience in, in Europe and maybe compare it to the, the photo book markets. Okay, um, that was actually one of the things I was reflecting myself about because um, I have spent so many times uh, at work um, with some analysis trying to understand what are the bottlenecks uh, for sales for maximizing the business sometimes it was um, for some simple commodity products like shampoos sometimes it was uh, for something luxury or lifestyle uh, and um, actually i think um, photo books they uh, have many similarities with uh, luxury and lifestyle products this is not something people physically need in their lives so it's not like they have some um, tasks in daily life to solve uh, with the photo books. Uh, but still there are some, let's say, hidden needs they may have, and sometimes they are not even aware. They don't um, consciously understand they have uh, those needs. And um, indeed, books, they're not commodity, no, not at all. They are sometimes art objects, uh, sometimes they're uh, platform for conversation, uh, for reflecting of, on some subjects, uh, like probably the books you have been presenting uh, here today. Um, and it, it's experience, uh, collaboration with the book, like experience of the book um, is uh, very important. Uh, and I was thinking that probably the model which um, big companies are using wouldn't work for the books. So I just decided to put everything on paper for myself, uh, to put uh, thoughts in order. 
Uh, and I used uh, the model which we are um, using in business. Uh, it's called uh, purchase funnel. And it's really simple and giving a lot of order to the thoughts. And businesses are using it to understand where is the problem. Is it really like pricing? It's not wrong, I'm too expensive for people. Or it's distribution, people cannot find me and they're not buying, therefore. Or I don't have good product, like competitors are better and therefore people are not choosing me. And um, actually this funnel starts from the like highest level, the biggest level, is percent of people who are aware about existence of the product. And um, with relation to the photo book, I personally believe this is um, one of the biggest issue. Uh, when we're discussing it in this room, it's not that obvious because we all are aware about the photo books. We are here at the festival. Uh, but if you try thinking about people just out there on the streets, uh, how many of them would know that uh, photo book exists? That there is this language uh, of storytelling, which is not text, which is not movie, but let's say movie in format of the book. It's not really that many people who are aware of that. Some of them even saw some photo books, but it didn't uh, stay in their mind. Like consciously, they didn't pay the attention that, okay, this is just the new way of storytelling and the new language. And also sometimes this absence of the literacy to read the photo book is a problem because um, how many years we spent to learn how to read the texts? If you only count years in school, from understanding single letters, starting to read something simple, up to the reading thick, big uh, books and uh, having some enjoyment from them, having some reflections from them, it's really years. Uh, and uh, if you think about what time we spend to get literacy to read the photo books, okay, again, in this room we probably spend some time educating ourselves, but again, out there in the schools, in the educational system, like in the traditional educational system, if you're not an artist, if you're not a designer, then it easily just goes unnoticed for many people. And even if they have a photo book in hands, they wouldn't know what to do with that. So this awareness to me, the uh, key barrier, and um, I was trying to make some judgments, some guesses. I don't really know what's the percent of the people um, like in the total population, and again, if you start thinking outside of Europe, if you start thinking of Africa, for example, I, I would suggest that the number of people who are aware of photo books in Africa is even smaller <laughs> comparing to Europe, but I think we shouldn't be go with more than one to five percent of people who have an idea about the photo books. And this is making our kind of market, potential market, really smaller. And then out of those who are aware of the product, photo books in our case, um, it would matter how much of those people are interested in the product and in the photo books. Uh, and sometimes awareness is a barrier um, to make some, to build some interest, but sometimes potential interest can help to build awareness. And if you have something as uh, interesting as photo books, uh, just giving people some education about the subject um, helps expanding the circle of aware tremendously. And they can speak with my experience in Russia uh, because actually we have almost zero awareness. Like nobody knows and nobody is interested, but wherever we are doing any kind of events like uh, lectures, discussions, exhibitions, uh, and people come completely with no ideas, but from the conversations, they're really building their passion. And sometimes after like two weeks exhibition, we have uh, like 20 people who are willing to, to, to learn more. They're actually asking where they can get more, uh, where they can get information, where they can get books. And uh, so it's kind of awareness which is going after the initial interest. And then um, if people are aware, if they're interested in the product, then all those subjects of distribution and availability of the product come up. So they need physical um, access to the books. And then after that, it's affordability. It's uh, the right pricing. Yeah. But you, as you say, awareness is the biggest barrier in creating a larger photo book audience. I think so. Yeah. And as you say, in Russia, there's almost no awareness. 
that's a pity, of course. Mm -hmm. And but also, in an optimistic way, this awareness may increase mm -hmm. in uh, a few years' time. Um, if you are okay with that, I would like to switch to Bas, because in the Netherlands there is m there is at least some awareness about photo books for many years already because in the Netherlands there's a long-standing tradition of producing high-quality photo books. We have photo book markets in uh, national newspapers. Uh, a lot of reviews appear about newly published photo books. Nevertheless, the, the audience in terms of people buying the photo books remains more or less stable. Yeah, correct. It's, well, it's, uh, my observation, basically what we, of course, do with photo books is we sell these books to, to ourselves. You know, we are as a community of photography lovers and makers and, and people involved. Um, we tend to sell these books to each other. That's basically, I think, for 70, 80 percent of every sale, of the sales made, it's just, we, we pump them around. In, in our community, I mean, and whether that's a good or a bad thing, I don't know. I mean, but it is, of course, of limited outreach, of limited impact, because we are the ones who tend to be better informed and so on. I'm not too, too, too optimistic in that sense that you, if we can really expand that. And um, to give you an example, um, a few years ago when, uh, let's say, the economy went down and also the, let's say, the support for the arts in the Netherlands was shrinking, one of the things that was uh, taken off uh, was the support for books. The Mondrian Fund was no longer allowed to support books, the production of, of uh, art books and photo books. And, um, and uh, I was part of a, of a group that lobbied a few years later when we got a signal that there might be uh, that the minister was aware of the fact that photo books and art books contributed to a great deal uh, in a country uh, uh, to, let's say, the, the awareness of, 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 of the issue, um, that sh she might think uh, positively and uh, that a lobby might be successful. So uh, I remember going with, with another publisher and someone from the Mondrian Fund and to, to visit the, the Ministry of Culture and, and to talk to, to, to functionaries yeah, the, the, the high, on the highest level who were, let's say, uh, developing, preparing for, for, the, for the minister. And, and actually, well, I dare to say they'd never seen a photo book in their life. And, um, and they didn't know what it was. So I was really happy to have brought a basket with a few important productions, including of course, Badger and Parr study that I picked up from the library of the Royal Library, which is right next door, to prove and say, hey, a fair share of the production in this book is actually Dutch. In this country, we have a, a long-standing tradition, and, and uh, both in design and in publishing photo books. And actually, it's also acknowledged internationally. And now, what we saw coming is that the number of titles that's going to be published because of the lack of support is actually going down quite steeply. Huh? If we want to remain important in this international arena, we will have to continue to support. It's actually little money in order to achieve a lot on an international level. But the function as we're talking to did not know what photo books actually were. You know, I'm not too optimistic in that sense that we could easily expand, let's say, that market. And um, that doesn't mean that we should not think about changing the model and making the best of that situation. And what we are faced with, of course, is that uh, there was a research recently under French publishers of photo books and um, they found out, actually they, they, they combined their data, only 30%, 25 to 30% of the books sold are today actually sold through physical bookstores. Uh, and that, that, that number is still dropping. That distribution channel is the best we can have because books are about Touching, touching, feeling, and, sniffing, and smelling. Yeah. You know, they are physical objects that you want to relate to, and and people like Richard can talk about you and, and, and inform you and say, "I have something here for you." And yet, 
I mean, increasingly they are getting more and more scarce. So we have to find, if we want to keep going, we have to find other ways of distributing. And the only answer is online, which will even make the work of the booksellers that remain, like Richard, uh, uh, more difficult. Which is, in that is, 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 a, is a horrible situation to be in. The only way to survive is go as we as I say in technical terms, go business to consumer, B2C, we sell directly to consumers and not business to business anymore, but at the same time it kills the specialists that remain. And, and um, but yeah, yeah, difficult dilemma. I would like to switch to Richard because uh, what Bas mentioned was there's still a need for people to physically touch the photo book as an object, to look it, to look at, have a look at it, to, to, to have a sniff at, uh, at uh, the, 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 the ink uh, that is used to, to print it, um, to, to, to feel the texture of the material uh, that, uh, that, that, that it's made of. And of course there is a special role uh, for photo book fairs and photo book festivals you yourself, you mentioned that you do not have a physical bookstore anymore, that you mostly sell your uh, books online, yet you are present here. What for you and your business is the importance of a, a photo book festival like like here at uh, Unseen and other ones mm -hmm. that have grown in recent years? Yeah, it's what you uh, said, that uh, the people I want to convince about the book and to see uh, and to show them what's special on this book, I only can do by uh, telling them the story about the book and uh, personal stories from the photographer uh, who has done the book and also to, to show them uh, what's a special development in making that it fits to the, to the content. The appearance of the book uh, as, a, as a soft cover, as a hard cover, as a, with inserts, I can only show if I, if I give it in the hand of the, of the client and he can look in, inside. But these are only one one group. The other group are the people who are heard about it, see it on the internet, and uh, see that it's win an award in any, in any uh, competition, and then they can buy them online. I have 80% of my sales are online, and on the market it's uh, only 20%, I'm saying, and it goes down, down more and more. I know. And, and do you happen to know what, what drives people to buy such a book online? Because there's a large, a really large number of, of books being produced every year yeah. in really small editions. Most photo book publishers publish n no more than nine books a year or even less. There's a small fraction of larger scale publishers who publish uh, larger quantities, numbers of books in, also in large print runs. But most, most uh, photo book publishers tend to publish on a small scale, small number of books, mm -hmm. and also there's uh, an influx of self-publishing by uh, independent artists, and that means that a lot of importance lies with the experts in the field, like critics and curators who publish photo book reviews and the, the annual best of and best published and best designed photo book lists. Do you happen to experience also an increase in, in photo book sales when, for instance, a positive review is published uh, anywhere? Yes, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm not informed. I have no information about all books, but of course there are uh, a few channels uh, with the same uh, persons, they are the influencers, and if they speak about a book and it's very important, I'm sometimes self-surprised uh, about uh, the, the amount of books they from one day to another will be ordered uh, in my web store, of course. And But when we are coming to the, to the fairs, uh, very often these books are in, on the, in the market. There's a second wave of people. They heard about it, but they didn't trust what they what what is spoken about or written about, and want to see them, want to feel it. And these people, as the a, a second wave, I call it, they are shown the books and to convince them also by yeah by tastes. Yeah, and as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of importance um, 
on, on, on the ways that curators mm -hmm. uh, and critics uh, make their picks out of the pile. And that's also because in, in regular publishing and larger scale publishing and mainstream books, uh, most of the time the publishers have marketing budgets, mm -hmm. but with smaller scale publishers or even independent artists publishing, uh, there's not so much of a budget. There are social media, of course, to, to use. What, what is your experience with that? Uh, in what ways do small scale publishers and independent artists use marketing tools to get their books across? Um, yeah, it's interesting because the big publishers will often have uh, big catalogs where they uh, shipping all all three months. They can uh, give a package from Kera and Hatiger Hans and Steidel, and this is the instrument they are using also for the for the stationary book book uh, shops. But I'm not not working uh, with the big publishers. But I'm I. Uh, for me, it's more important to work with the with smalls, and they don't have the skills, but they go by their own on the festivals now, and to to show the books because yeah, it's also uh, uh, how to, to 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 get the money back to cover the costs for production and for the other things they want also to 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 yeah to yeah. to cover. So so part of the marketing strategy in in cases like yours, a uh, collective of independent artists, is just to be there to show up your physical presence as well and your ability to to tell the stories behind each book. Exactly. That's uh, that's why we started coming to the festivals. Uh, it's not only opportunity to sell here directly, but it's opportunity to have a conversation. So uh, the festivals, it's opportunity not only to sell, it's opportunity to have the conversation, um, to build connections, actually to get those uh, reviews in the magazines and uh, with the curators, uh, because otherwise if we are sitting somewhere and we are just sending messages by email and nobody saw our books, it's uh, next to impossible. But here with the real book on hand, um, we can show what we are doing, we can explain more about the projects, and um, get some publications, get some publicity, um, get some network, and uh, actually uh, those connections on top of social media, of course, actually the networking, uh, the connections, they are helping to uh, push books forward. And um, actually I would say that we are trying to go mostly by this way and uh, sell most of the books directly by us, not uh, partnering very much with the um, bookshops. So the, the strategy will be to build strong connections on a personal basis with buyers or... Uh, or influencers, like opinion leaders. Influencers and in institutions, as you said. Many yes. of the books that you have sold were sold to institutions as well. Yes, and uh, actually also festival is an opportunity to meet with the institutions. It's hard to come into the museum just <laughs> as a visitor and uh, start selling something. But uh, to the festivals, uh, some buyers from the museums, libraries, institutions are coming deliberately. Also, they're searching for some new publications. And this is also our opportunity uh, to get in touch with them and build connections for further collaboration. Yeah. Uh, we're nearly at 5 o'clock. That means actually Unseen Photo Festival is reaching its end. Um, we've been talking about uh, photo book markets uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, most of them in, uh, in terms of commercial value, in terms of sale, in terms of um, the, 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 the book as an object, but uh, last but not least, I would like to um, talk with you a bit about the photo book market space in another way, because a market space is obviously the place to sell things, but in another sense, a marketplace is also a forum, a place where you can meet people and where you can exchange 
uh, ideas and experiences. The three of you have been here at Unseen uh, Photo Book Market for the past three days. Uh, is there anything that you have come across that you have experienced here? A pers you've made a personal connection, for instance, that you would like to share with us, uh, Richard? Uh, the most I can say is that the people are still interested in photo books, but uh, very often I hear that they said, okay, nothing, not so changing any, anything in the book market, like, like uh, uh, since my last visit on uh, our photo book fair or in, uh, in another fair. And uh, I, my experience, personal experience is that the people come back to older books. So I put in my shelf also titles from the last 10 years. And it's very interesting to see that there's still an interest and that they are happy to find these books uh, also. And so this changes also my position that I'm uh, try to, uh, to, to balance out that I'm not selling so much new titles, but the older titles more. Not like like Café Lemic is a yes. classic in itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Natalia, uh, you told me that uh, your collective is also at this moment present in New York, Art Book Fair. Yes, absolutely. And we were exchanging uh, our impressions uh, about how people are reacting on the books because we have more or less the same lineup here and in New York. And uh, interestingly, we noticed that some books, um, they're very well accepted here, for example, but they get no attention in New York and can vice versa. Can you give an example? Um, like some of the projects which are built on the archive stories and um, about memory, um, they're very interesting uh, in Europe. But in America, people are having less ex interest to them. It's not like within their uh, interest. Uh, one of the books we are presenting is uh, by Igor Muchen, um, pretty famous um, photographer from Russia, one of the uh, teachers from Rochenk Art School. And um, that was the opposite situation. Here in Amsterdam, we had very little interest to that. We heard that, uh, well, it's too classic. Not very interesting, but in New York, it's just flying out of the table because it gives um, some interesting representation of Russia during perestroika times, something people probably didn't have the chance uh, to see often. So they're really enthusiastic about this book. Yeah, that's, that's remarkable. Yeah. Yes. Bas. Yeah, maybe it's not so specifically about this time, but in general, um, I very much like, I think this is the second edition that the, uh, the book market at Unseen is between the exhibitions. And um, it only makes the contrast uh, bigger. Uh, the, for me, the real adventures are, of course, in the book market. Uh, there, let's say, stories, human stories, are told to me and trying to reach out to me. Whereas if I get into the exhibitions, Part, the part, but of course, I often get the, the feeling that I'm looking at decoration. Uh, it's hard, it's not so, it's, it's, and it's normal. I mean, galleries sell for people's homes and some two collections, of course, that may judge the work a little differently, but yeah, what do you want, to, what would I like to look at in my home? Well, personally, in my home, I can only look at into the landscape and onto books. And I can recommend that combination of landscape and books as a view from your house. And uh, please keep on buying photo books, folks. I mean, it's a wonderful medium. Don't forget, by the way, also there is an electronic equivalent, which is fascinating, which has also now, let's say, a history of about 25 years where uh, miracles have, have happened. Don't um, be blind for, for those, and including its preservation, one of my um, hang-ups, because we, we're forgetting about it. The photo book remains wonderful. And photo books, uh, making that reference with electronic storytelling, um, it's remarkable, of course, and that's also what you perceive at Unseen, is that um, books tend to become uh, more radical, more radically books and more radically objects um, now that, let's say, the possibilities of doing these stories online um, are plentiful and, and, and also wonderful. So really the choice of a book is a, 
is a very well motivated book, a uh, very motivated choice in being very specific uh, about that choice and doing it on paper and giving it these tactile qualities that, uh, that the book is very much about. So uh, please, uh, yeah, having it there amidst the, decor the decoration department is for me still the best place. Uh, uh, by, by ways of, of, of a conclusion, I would like to quote Richard because I found in uh, an earlier interview with you actually connecting books and landscapes, that a good photo book is like a journey into an unknown world. So there are still a lot of unknown worlds out there, and I know a lot of people of you right here in this uh, uh, hall are producing these journeys. Keep on journeying, keep on traveling, and keep on sharing your stories with us. Thank you. There will be some room for questions and remarks after the official part of this session. And uh, within a few weeks, there will be some sort of um, a booklet uh, downloadable at the Unseen Festival uh, site. Thanks, and enjoy the rest of your evening.